Um, thank you. Uh, the USF Bookstore has a table in the back. If you didn't see that on your way in, please stop by after the reading to buy some books of Kevin's. Also, there are refreshments in the back. You probably saw. And once the reading's over, we will open the wine and the beer. Please stay, enjoy those, socialize, chat, have fun. Um, so for the next step, I'm going to introduce um, a poetry faculty member here. It's Doug Powell. He'll take the next step. Doug. <laughs> Thank you for that lovely round of applause. Um, I am so short. I, I, I'm so honored to, to get to introduce Kevin tonight. Um, he is uh, an amazing person, human being, poet, nonfiction writer, uh, curator, um, all of the above, and um, also someone that I have enjoyed uh, as a friend for many years now. Um, we won't count how many. Um, I'm going to do the unpardonable sin um, by reading a little bit of Kevin's poetry, but I won't read an entire poem lest he should be poised to read that same poem. I have put down words in order to again breathe, writes Kevin Young. Have set aside my horn to hear inside the pounding, the loud foundry, its anvil long ignored. Kevin Young's poems are muscular breathing bodies, resurrections of place and person, brought to life anew in the short quick lines that dance and tumble down the page like kids wrestling, lovers twirling, sunlight glinting off the surface of a river. Metrical foots shift just as fast as a boxer's stance, the old one-two still packing enough punch to lay you out. I have been laid out by these poems. You could spend a lifetime hoping to mend the moon and it's a wonder the world keeps its whirling. The pleasures of brevity, tercets, couplets, abbreviations, take center stage and the drama that ensues from line to line, turn to turn in Young's work. In his poem, Early Blues, he writes, once I ordered a pair of shoes, they never came. The interval between the start of that sad story and its haunting ending is short but full of meaning. The silence at the end of the line is, as Robert Creeley said of William Carlos Williams, a silence in which the heart could break. Now, lest I be accused of attending to form over content, I should note that this precision of line and metrical acuity has about it the kind of dex dexterity one finds in film editing, where still and moving images can be combined to slow or quicken the pace, escalating or de-escalating tension accordingly. This is the same principle used in DJ the mixing of sound and song samples to manipulate the somatic response of the listener. And it is this latter technique which m seems most applicable to Kevin Young's interpolations and counterpoints of sonic matter. Speech, rhetoric, interjection, and song, a remix of oral textures drawn from gin joint vernacular, pulpit preaching, digs and dozens, shade and tea, shouts and murmurs, scripture, epistle, testimony, and lyrics, all woven into moods and blues and elegy and ode. M.C. Young is the master blaster, the guy who gets this party started and sets the roof on fire. Blackness is not the subject, but the subjectivity the awareness of the poems which 
over the course of a celebrated career have included many subjects within the personal and historic scope of one author's curatorial mind. Erotic, familial, and fraternal love, parenting, childing, forms of music, forms of resistance, Basquiat, Amistad, Hank Aaron, film noir, belief, grief. Kevin Young reaches into a literary past that withstood the lash and bondage, survived on peas and side meat, forged a new vernacular out of African syntax and Caribbean rhythms, brought new life to old English, and saved poetry from the mundane metrics of the all too predictable I am. As a young poet at Harvard, he and a remarkable group of writers known as the Dark Room Collective took up where the black arts movement of the 60s left off, reinvigorating an art often in danger of dying from its own seriousness. They made poetry matter to echo a pale critic flailing at the end of a previous century. Young's poems speak for themselves, of course, but it's gratifying to know that other opinions are likewise leaning. Kevin Young has been the recipient of a number of honors and recognitions, including a Wallace Stegner Fellowship at Stanford, a Guggenheim Fellowship, a United States Artist James Baldwin Fellowship, a National Endowment for the Arts Fellowship, the Lenore Marshall Poetry Prize for his book, The Hours, the John C. Zacharis First Book Prize for his first book, Most Way Home, the Patterson Poetry Prize for Jelly Roll, residencies at the McDowell Colony and the Vermont Studio Center, the Penn Open Book Award for the Gray Album, induction into the American Academy of Arts and Sciences, and nominations for the National Book Award, the National Book Critics Circle Award, and the LA Times Book Award. I doubt I've even scratched the surface of all his accomplishments as a writer. Moreover, he has been a distinguished faculty member at University of Indiana and at Emory University. He now wears two very prestigious hats as both the director of the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture and the poetry editor of The New Yorker. While compiling this list, I listened to a playlist, sort of getting myself in the mood for Kevin's oeuvre. Um, and these are the following songs that were on the playlist. Mama Used to Say by Junior, The Boss by Diana Ross, Looking for the Perfect Beat by Africa Bombada and Soul Sonic Force, Funky Little Beat by Connie, Bust a Move by Young MC, Hot Shot by Karen Young, Don't You Know That by Luther Vandross, The Pleasure Principle by Janet Jackson, <laughs> Bring the Noise by Public Enemy, and I Want to Thank You by Alicia Myers. I want to thank you, Kevin, for coming here tonight to honor us with your words. Thank you for that incredible introduction. You had me at mood and oeuvre. It was, it was great. Um, so uh, it's a real pleasure to be here back in San Francisco. Uh, I indeed lived here, um, and I'm going to read some poems about living here to start. These are from a book called Book of Hours. This is a poem called Gravity. Gravity. This is about driving from LA to San Francisco. Gravity. I've tried telling this before, how the light stabbed its way out of the clouds, rays aimed everywhere. No, it was the earth that day, drawing light out of the sky, heavy, 
gravity pulling the light to rest on its chest, a ladder leaning. In the valley north of the city of angels, mountains around us, my passenger, a twin, one half of two, their mother killed a year or so before, helicopter catching a power line, gone. And I, knowing nothing then, or too much, said little, maybe sorry, which isn't all you can say, but mostly, though I didn't know that then. And we were fighting with my warbling tape deck, no doubt, when we saw it tumbling, end over end across the highway, a car flipping and spitting up dust, and God knows what else, midair. And almost before I could reach the shoulder, my friend out across the lanes, racing to the crumpled car, to his mother. Even then, I knew it was her he hoped to meet. Instead, in the scorched grass of the median, a spare or spared shoe. Books flapping their wings, and a man, dazed, somehow thrown clear, kneeling. We were not the first. Already some off-duty nurse or Samaritan beside him, within seconds, asking what I should have. Are you all right? He held no answers, no tongue for where he had just been, almost stayed. The car turtled over on its back, its brokenness that could be our bodies, not yet our lives or his. And my friend, the twin, almost there in time, me slow behind, the last of the first, scared to see. Looking on in horror and wonder, clothes tossed everywhere, now no one would wear. The broken mirrors, missing bodies they once were conjoined to, closer than they appear. A blinding, splintered sky, helpless, we soon would turn and sail off under. This is called The Mission. It's nice not having to explain the title. <laughs> but there's this neighbor, oh, no, sorry. <laughs> it's, it's habits die hard. Back there then, I lived across the street from a home for funerals. Afternoons, I'd look out the shades and think of the graveyard behind Emily Dickinson's house. How death was no concept, but soul after soul, she watched pour into the cold New England ground. Maybe it was the son of the mission, maybe just being more young, but it was less disquiet than comfort, days the street filled with cars for a wake. Children played tag out front while the bodies stuck in the back. The only hint of death, those clusters of cars, lights low as talk, idling dark as the second-hand suits that fathers or sons, now orphans, had rescued out of closets, praying they still fit. Most did. Most laughed despite themselves, shook hands, and grew hungry out of habit, evening coming on again. The home's clock broke like a bone, always read three. Mornings or dead of night, I wondered who slept there and wrote letters I later forgot I sent my father, now find buoyed up among the untidy tide of his belongings. He kept everything but alive. I have come to know sorrows, not noun, but verb. Something that, unlike living by doing right, you do less of. The sun is too bright. Your eyes adjust, become like the night. Hands 
covering the face. Its numbers, dark and unmoving, unlike the cars that fill and start to edge out, quiet cortege crawling half dim till I could not see to see. So I, I read that poem uh, one time and someone said, well, you know, Emily Dickinson, she didn't live in San Francisco, did she? Um, it was a friend. She do now. What to read next? I've been thinking a lot about place, I guess. Um, and my new book, Brown, takes up several places, but uh, it starts with Kansas, where I went to um, high school. I moved when I was 10. I moved six times when I was 10. Um, both of my parents are from Louisiana, so, uh, you know, sometimes I joke that we were on the run or, uh, you know, when people ask me why. Um, we brought our food with us, uh, and sort of I've written a lot about that. And, um, but I wanted to really turn to and think about what it was like to live there uh, when I did. And so there's a number of poems. I'll read just a few. This one's called Ad Astra Per Aspra, which is the uh, state motto of Kansas. Does anyone know what that means? Who said that? Speak up. It means uh, to the stars through difficulty. Very close. Um, excellent. Hey. Um, I think that. Uh, that's just a beautiful idea. Because um, it's not like just to the stars, which is good, right? But difficulty, you know? Um, and it seems like a poem, uh, or at least what a poem tries. So I'll just read the first little section of it. It's uh, named after the Kansas bird, which I won't quiz you on. Um, it's Western Meadowlark. Western Meadowlark. Land of unlikely. Land of no sea. Land of all you can eat. Land of 17. Land of silos, missile and otherwise. Land of squinting eyes. Land of wheat and milo. Land of bejeweled jorts. Land of A and W. Of Gates barbecue. These are my dressiest shorts. <laughs> land of gray ash. Land of acid wash. Land of winded cough, of neatly piled trash. Land of squat buildings and broad slate sky. Land of land never ending. Land of doesn't matter why. Land of soft serve. Land of dead man's curb. Land of lost mutts. I'm not racist, but. Land of summer severe. Land of persevere. Land of nothing near. Into this here. Strode tall John Brown, in one hand a Bible, the other a rifle, face more scowl than frown. Oh yes, um, there's a new biography of Arthur Ashe. He's one of my heroes. Uh, first black man to win Wimbledon. Um, organized, as you may know, um, protests against South Africa and players playing there, which they did a lot before him. White players, at least. Um, and you know, he died so young. He died of AIDS. Um, and he's just a powerful force. And I grew up with a picture of him on my wall um, that my mom found somewhere or something and had him sign. So this poem thinks about that. Ash. For years I've wanted to write how exactly I felt with you hovering on my wall, framed mid-air, about to strike the ball above you, Arthur Ash. In your tennis whites, I pictured you lifted into whatever came after this photo's instant. 
firing a volley or striking a serve down the throat of your opponent like a pill. Your signature below my name seemed more real to me than most things. Bullies or whatever wisdom got cracked out of me like a knuckle. More real than being unable to see without glass before my eyes. I saw you sported glasses too. Your hair a microphone cover to help keep the static down. Even your photo has a sound. Call it about to be. Call it maybe. No, probably. Name it after every unlikely you made into something. You swing in my head like Count Basie, only there is no royalty, no music anymore like yours. I played a lot of baseball when I was a kid, and I played on an all-black baseball team in Kansas. We were popular. And this is a poem about that. It's called The Division. It's from a longer sequence, but just read this. The Division. We played in blue jeans, unlike other teams, in their tidy pal uniforms the cops paid for. We were outlaws, our hats dark maroon shirts with our names on the back, skin black and brown and in between. We played a mean game, if only after a season of being the bad news bears. Losing, umps even invoking the mercy rule, some games. We'd wake and pray for rain or an ankle sprain. One day something gave way, the spokes, they turned, and all of a sudden we won, beating teams twice our size who skunked us before, giving goose eggs to kids in golden sleeves and tall corn yellow socks, their new cleats, aimed at our shins. We were our own Negro League. Our mascot was Reggie, chubby, goofy, Marcel the relief, and Damien our best pitcher, his long nails stabbing the stitches, his wind-up quick change clipping the corner of the dish. I even saved one game. Bases loaded, the bullpen spent or gone wild, the backup pitcher's backup. I threw slow but straight, the final strike turtling across the plate. The team hoisted me high that night, our fathers for once smiling wide. Our final game, we took first place and won the division. The sore faces the losing team wore less shock or disbelief. That you could take than disgrace and plain rage. The mask of their catcher tossed into the Kansas dust. Anger sat there, uneasy and too easy. Even their parents hated us claimed to have forgotten our trophies. Who cared if they couldn't take watching us celebrate? That for the required final handshake, good game, good game, good game. They christened their palms with spit. Later, we'd wash up clean and sprinkles or chocolate dip hid our ice cream, vanishing. So I was writing this book, um, and I was thinking a lot about childhood and my childhood in Kansas, uh, as you can see by some of the poems. And then later on, I realized I wanted to write, or I couldn't help it, I wrote a few poems about my son. Um, and his growing up, in some ways very differently, but in some ways, uh, it was the midst when I was writing the poems of, you know, every time I opened my phone, there was another black kid getting shot, or um, especially a black boy or two. Uh, and so I started trying to write about him with this sort of thing looming over it. Um, and those poems made their way into the book. This poem starts with an image of him uh, in his first sleepover. 
and uh, his room being empty and that sort of strange feeling, um, which I think also echoes some of those disappearances. I doubt it. It's as if you have died when I head into your room, only it's aging bears tucked in at night. Everything just as you left it, but quiet, to switch off the lone night lines. Though you are just down the street at our neighbor boy's sleepover, turning nine tonight, where surely you barely sleep. I bet you're up drinking apple juice the way we once down soda or pop or root beer, RC or Atari by the leader, playing war and bullshit, what we code-named I Doubt It, though we boys were full of confidence, sleeping bags a war zone where nobody died or got sent home, where we'd play fight and camp out and need no light to keep us company till dawn. This is how we learnt about tomorrow, when I will wander over and tug you back where you also belong, by the hand, somewhat awake, sleeping bag under your arm, empty as a chrysalis. So I think Doug hinted at the fact that um, sometimes I read about music. And, and I mean, it's obvious I need that playlist, isn't that right? At least the list of the playlists. Um, so I thought I'd read some music poems. Uh, I'll read this one. It's an uh, ode to Old Dirty Bastard. Do I need to explain? <laughs> He wasn't old, uh, but he was dirty. Um, from Wu Tang Clan. Uh, o, o to ODB. F you. Motor mouth clown of class warfare, welfare millionaire. How dare you disappear when we need your shimmy shimmy ya here? Osiris of this shiznit, your body's now scattered on wax. No monument, no fortune left, just what you made and spent, I hope, on skunk weed and worse. Good morning, heartache. Your carelessness reminds us how quick we are to judge, how serious things done become. Dirty as the South, sweet as neon cherry pie filling from a can. I hear folks still call your number in Brooklyn at all hours and ask the sleepy, still listed, Russell Jones, no relation, come out and play. Baby, I got your money. Big baby Jesus, Dirt McGirt, alias addict, of course you can't be reached. You're too busy, Rusty, wigging out, dancing in a hump suit and Jerry Curl toupee. Your tiny, tacky dreads hidden, your grill of gold melted down to pay off St. Pete or Beelzebub to buy just one more dose of freedom. This is the hip hop portion. So I wrote a um, sonnet sequence called De La Soul is Dead, and I'll read some. <clears throat> De La Soul is Dead. It's about, you know, the when music was really good. Um, <laughs> sorry. And I, a lot of it was here when I lived here, but also before in the late 80s and 90, early 90s. De La Soul is Dead, a roller skating jam named Saturdays. We were black then, not yet African-American, so we danced every chance we could get. Thursday and Saturdays, we chant, the roof, the roof, the roof is on fire, we don't need no water, and folks' perms began to turn. We had begun to dread or wear locks anyway. Our temples, we'd fade. 
We said word and death, said dang and down and fly. We gave no goodbyes, just all right then, or bet. No one was dead yet. People who died, Jim Carroll band. No one was dead yet. Not that some didn't try, often friends of mine. These are people who died, died. Weekends drank too much, then broke into the pool and swam, though I was barely good at that. The bottom I never did touch. Home, almost dried, we listened for the dawn or to Mr. Dabalina, Mr. Bob Dabalina. Glory, hella stupid, doused in eyeliner or lycra, and that was just the boys. Our favorite song was noise. The scenario. The two of us met black, sorry, the two of us black met one night, dancing alongside each other to tribe at a party in the world's smallest room. Someone from Carolina brought moonshine and over the beat, the clanking heat, Philippe leaned over his date to say, hey man, we should be friends. What you know, yo. And that was that. Popping the caps of brown red striped bottles with his teeth, he'd drink out the side of his mouth, sly. We heads kept ours dreaded, crowned. A decade later, he was gone. The scenario, our favorite of 500 songs. When you were mine, nothing passed us by. No. Baby, you're much too fast. In 1990, we had us an early 80s party. Nostalgic already, I dug out my best OPs and two polos, fluorescent, worn simultaneously, collar up, pretend preppy. When Blondie came on, Rapture, Be Pure, things really got going, and then the dancing got shut down by some square. What was sleep even for? Housequake. What was sleep even for? The year before, a freshman, I threw a Prince party, re-screwed the lights red and blue, the room all purple, people dancing everywhere. Click play on the cassette till we slow sweated to erotic city or do me baby. I'm going down to Alphabet Street. Did anyone sleep alone that night? I feel for you. <laughs> Shut up already. Damn, cabbage patch, reverse running man. Get some life wherever you can. the last day of our acquaintance. How late it would get. <clears throat> Every party was an after party. Some nights we'd even let ourselves forget that dawn would soon come. I do not want what I haven't got. Mostly it did. Sometimes the morn was met less alone, her beauty and scent, her buzzed head numbing your arm. Once you start, how can you quit all this Remembering, we make love like memories, if lucky and not too late. The choice is yours. Too late. The silence, ours, now sounds like the second when the music stops. Not for good, but for a breath or two. Engine, engine, number nine on the New York Transit line. If my train jumps off the track and now we're back up. Oh, how high. We jump, reaching for the sky, hurricane purple, and a night mostly black, dark blue, red. Nobody, nobody was dead yet. Let's read a couple more. You doing all right? I think I'll read um, a poem. This is a request from Ardency. I know some of y'all read that book. And it has a kind of 
benediction. And after that poem, I feel like I, I sort of need. Um, it's called Choir Morning. There's a series of choirs in the back of the book. Um, and this one, um, I don't know, it always sort of stuck with me. It's sort of the last poem in the book, though there's a little epilogue. Choir Morning. May the river remember you. May the road be your only cross. May you rise. May your son, not the silence, take your hand. May the lost, may the mountain move to meet you. May the climb be quick. May the mountain, may the sea shut at last its door. May the moon, may the ash, not the snow. May the ground swallow you whole and the sun. May the last be the first. May the lost, may the stars for once be still. Forget heaven. May you wake again with the rain. So I think I'll end with a few poems from the last section of Brown, or two. This poem is a poem, uh, it's for a friend of mine, John T. Edge, who took this trip with me, kind of a pilgrimage, uh, to Mississippi, where John T. lives. But uh, we're also, Emmett Till was killed. And um, I'm not sure we even knew we were gonna drive to see that. Uh, I mean, not that there's a place to see, though I was recently reading that the, he was lynched, I mean, this is t terrible, in a barn, actually, and they know where this barn is. Um, it's way in the country. I mean, a terrifying place now uh, with, you know, a flashlight. Um, I can only imagine what this teenage boy felt. Um, but going there, I was really struck by the ghostliness of it. and. You know, as the poem is pretty much describes that, but as soon as we start driving, it started to snow, and snow in southern Mississippi and the Delta, not the most common thing. And, you know, sometimes things happen and you hope you can write a poem. I, then I sort of knew I had to. Uh, and so I'll read this in one more. This is called Money Road. I might wait till they stop laughing. <laughs> I never use the word cackling aloud, but um, money road. On the way to Money, Mississippi, we see little ghosts of snow falling faint as words while we try to find Robert Johnson's muddy, maybe grave. Beside little Zion, along the highway side, this stone keeps its offering, bud and Louisiana hot sauce the ground giving way beneath our feet. The blues always dance cheek to cheek with the church, Booker's place back in Greenwood still standing, its long green bar beautiful, friendship church just a holler away. Shotgun, shotgun, shotgun. Rows of colored houses as if the same can of bright stain might cover the sins of rotting wood. Now mostly tar paper and graffiti holding McLaren Street together. R.I.P. Bucci. The undead walk these streets seeking something we take pictures of and soon flee. The hood of a car yawns open in awe. Men's heads peer in its lion's mouth seeking their share. For sale, squash, and snap beans. The midden of oyster shells behind Lusco's, the tiny O of a bullet hole and Booker's plate glass window. Even the Salvation Army thrift store closed bars over every door. We're on our way again, away, along the money road, past grand houses and port cashiers set back from the lane crossing the bridge to find markers of what's no more there. Even the underpass has a name. It's all too grave. The fake sharecropper homes of Tallahatchie Flats rented out 
along the road, staged bottle trees chasing away nothing. The new outhouse whose crescent door foreign tourists pay extra for. Cotton planted in strict rows just for show. A quiet snow globe of pain I want to shake. While all the flakes fall like ash, we race the train to reach the place Emmett Till last whistled or smiled or did nothing. Money more a crossroads than the crossroads be. Its gnarled tree, the Bryant store facing the tracks now turnt the color of earth, tumbling down slow as the snow, white and insistent as the woman who sent word of that uppity boy, her men who yanked you out your uncle's home into the yard, into oblivion, into this store abutting the money gin co whose sign worn away now reads on or sin, I swear, whose giant gin fans, like those lashed and anchored to your beaten body, still turn. Shot, dumped, dredged, your face not even a mask, a marred, unspared, sightless stump. All your mother insists we must see to know what they did to my baby. The true Tallahatchie twisting south. The Delta death's second cousin once removed. You down for only the summer to leave the stifling city where later you will be waked, displayed, defiant, a dark glass. There are things that cannot be seen, but must be. Buried, barely. This place, no one can keep. And how to kill a ghost. The fog of our outdoor talk. We breathe, we grieve, we drink our tidy drinks. I think now winter will out, the snow bless and kiss this cursed earth, or is it cussed? I don't yet know. Let the cold keep still your bones. Um, and thanks again for coming out. This is called Hive, and it's the last poem in the book. <clears throat> I almost took it out like 20 times, um, but it seems like we need it right now. Hive. The honeybee's exile is almost complete. You can carry them from hive to hive, the child thought, and that is what he tried walking with them thronging between his pressed palms. Let him be right. Let the gods look away, as always. Let this boy, who carries the entire actual whirring world in his calm, unwashed hands, barely walking, bear us all there, buzzing, unstung. Thank you. Thank you for that. Elaine. Sure. Um, Kevin's going to answer some questions, and then uh, after the reading, there is a book table in the back. Thank you, USF Bookstore, for being here with a ton of Kevin's books. Um, and thank you, Mark. Thanks, Bauer. Mark. Yes. Um, and stick around. There's booze. Oh, uh, yeah. <laughs> I'm painfully where I'm standing between you and booze, so. Like, are there any questions? 
Yeah. Um, I think I thought like it was triumphant somehow. What was the oh, sorry. Yeah, the question was why did I leave that crappy hive poem in my book? It's weird. Oh no, sorry. That's not what he said. He said why? What was my decision there? What was I wrestling with? I think I thought it seemed kind of. Um, I mean, I wanted to leave with bones. You know, I just wanted to leave with that sort of feeling, that wish, because it's not a dis. Uh, it's a disquieting wish, but it's also a, a sincere one to have Emmett Till comforted, uh, even if it's, excuse me, literally cold comfort. But I just couldn't do it, really. Um, but I didn't want to, like, say, well, now everything, you know, like, there was no way to kind of patch over it. So it was kind of a fable, and I think that made me nervous, but actually that's what I like about it now. Yeah. Okay, yeah. I was wondering, I was wondering um, uh, how did the ordering come about? Yeah. How did you decide what sections to wear, what you go to Yeah, the question is, in Brown, uh, my newest book that I was reading for, from mostly, um, the sections are sort of interrelated, but stand alone, how did they come about? For me, um, it was actually the interrelatedness that I had a hard time with. Um, there was a one point when I showed it to someone and it was like all the public poems like the Arthur Ashe poem and the Hank Aaron poem were in one section and all the poems about sort of growing up in Kansas were another. And uh, my friend was like, uh, that's weird. You know, why aren't they talking to each other? And uh, that really helped me because I, I, for the longest time it was like two or three sections and then ended with Money Road, I think. And um, once I realized that they were all part of a, story's the wrong word, but part of a movement, let's say, like a symphonic feeling. That really helped me because I saw that Hank Aaron and me playing baseball, I mean, we didn't have the same skill set, or I didn't. Um, but they, they had something to do with, you know, his hate mail and that sort of weird experience of we're not going to give you your trophies um, weren't so far apart. Uh, and, um, you know, there were things that happened with my son uh, you know, a neighbor calling him the N-word or something that bring you right back to uh, moments in my childhood. And so I really want to layer the book that way. And it helped to have these kind of anchoring poems, like the title poem, Brown. Um, both, uh, I grew up in Kansas, as I said, in, in Topeka. I went to church with that Linda Brown of Brown v. Board, the case that desegregated our country mostly, or somewhat. Um, played piano in that church and sang, and I knew her. And um, so I wanted to always write about that. And so the brownness in the book started governing it as much as anything. And uh, James Brown and John Brown, all these people came to me and, and helped kind of anchor that movement, um, but also talk to each other. Great question. Yeah. <laughs> wow. Any last questions? Yeah. Yeah. And we know there's some pure reason, and it's very much kind of the world of the country. Well, it's a very big thing. And so, for the ones who are just wondering if you had heard some of these chapters, they were read by themselves, or did you connect them as a reading by the book? Yeah, the question was about Bunk, and uh, which is a nonfiction book I wrote uh, that came out last year. It's now in paper back. But, um, it's a good question about whether uh, they stood alone. I really was very aware that they were chapters. Uh, so they might have felt like they were alone, but that was more like I wanted them to be strong as chapters. Um, and I wanted them to kind of, I think the thing that changed that book for me is I had written it in the most sort of, uh, I guess, a poet's way. Like I just was discovering, you know, that I thought these things. And about three or four years into it, I was like, oh, it's a history. Like, maybe I should start with P.T. Barnum. And so P.T. Barnum came in the middle. You know, it's like bizarre. Um, and so I think the discovery part of it 
was important. And I still think that what I like about it, after I rearranged it and made it more chronological, though it does jump around some, is that it still feels like a poet's book, at least in my opinion, in the sense that it, it's interested in associations and connections and these broad uh, strokes of history, which I think my poetry is too, um, and the way that individuals kind of push history forward or, or find themselves in history. Uh, and that book, I think, tried to capture that both by the structure and in uh, sort of the individual chapters. Is there a last question back there somewhere? Oh, yeah. yeah, on the way back. Yeah. Yeah, the question was about the Schomburg Center for Research of Black Culture, where I'm a director, um, and has that influenced my writing life? Um, well, uh, it's funny because I remember trying to decide if I should take the job, though, as soon as I, you know, was sort of up for it, I was like, I mean, how could I not? Like, I, I knew that, you know, for instance, we got, uh, a few months after I got there, we announced and got James Baldwin's papers. You know, how can you not want to participate in that? We, we just got Malcolm X's autobiography, um, the manuscript of it, which was uh, not known for, or had never been seen. It still hasn't been seen, um, but I've seen it. Um, <laughs> and soon you will too. Um, and, uh, you know, a lost chapter of Malcolm X. Like those kind of, uh, you know, and James Baldwin was starting and it's been a long process, but Malcolm X, I literally went to an auction on a Tuesday and Thursday we had this thing and Friday it was in the front page of the New York Times, you know. And that's the kind of experience that, does that affect my writing? I don't know, it affects my inner being, you know. Um, but I also think that the other things I was mentioning just before about history and my sense of how the archive, I think, helps us understand history, but the archive is also about where we are now and what we value and what we didn't value. Uh, there's still things to be discovered in the archive, and you, you may know this and uh, uh, probably do, surely. Um, but, you know, we're still finding Claude McKay novels in archives. I mean, that's just amazing. This writer from the Harlem Renaissance, they found two novels. Um, one was sort of not known, and then one was kind of known but not published, you know. Um, this is really important, not to, and Dornell Hurston, they just published News Dornell Hurston. What an exciting time, and I think that speaks as much to our need to understand, which I don't think we fully do. I mean, the Harlem Renaissance has been written about a lot. Um, you can tell I'm excited. Um, but it's also that it, ha it isn't totally understood, and the Schomburg Center was founded during the Harlem Renaissance, 1925. So we've been there 93 years in Harlem. And that kind of steadiness helps us have conversations. Uh, you know, when there's uh, people thinking about Black Lives Matter, we have those conversations already. So we're not just starting those conversations new. And I think that's very important, our institutional qualities. And that helps me think about poetry, which I think is having some of these same conversations uh, ahead of time, but also looking back uh, and I see those things as really joined, and sometimes they're joined through poetry, sometimes they're joined uh, for me through my own writing, but a lot of times it's joined through the exhibitions we're putting on or the, um, you know, uh, programs we have, which are really dynamic. Um, and we think about everything from slavery to black power to, you know, uh, queer fashion, you know, I mean, that's sort of, the Schomburg is able to talk about all these different things and people come there because it's a safe space. Uh, and when I started out in archives um, 15 years ago, sort of working as a curator, I, I remember thinking, like, wouldn't it be fun if we had a dance party, you know? And, um, you know, we have a house music edition. Uh, we have a thing called First Fridays. Every First Friday we have basically a dance party. And the house music edition is like, I think there were 1,200 people in our um, archive dancing inside and outside. We have an inside, we have Langston Hughes' ashes or beneath a sculpture, a, a mosaic on our floor. You know, like, this is, to me, Langston's ghost in a good way, like, pushing us. Um, and I think about that a lot, you know, and that kind of connectedness, which isn't just brainy, but bot embodied. And there's a lot of survivors in that room, you know, and there's a lot of people dancing 
like there's no tomorrow, but also knowing that there's tomorrow and knowing that there's been this past. And I think that the Schomburg, uh, as if you can't tell, like does that for me. And I think poetry does that for me too. And um, so I, I hope those things are knitted uh, together and um, we'll see how it comes out in my own writing. Thanks everyone.